Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, it's, it's not often that a new book comes out with Durham as its focus, so I am always excited uh, when that happens. It's a real cause for celebration. The Secret Game, a wartime story of courage, change, and basketball's lost triumph was released just last month, and I'm delighted to be introducing its author, Scott Ellsworth, who's going to read and talk with us today about it. He did some of his research in the North Carolina collection at the library, and it, it was such a pleasure to work with him. Scott received a PhD in history from Duke in 1982. He has written about American history for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other publications, and has appeared on National Public Radio, The Today Show, PBS's The American Experience, The History Channel, and in both film and broadcast documentaries. Formerly a historian with the Smithsonian Institution, he's currently a faculty member in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. He's also the author of Death in a Promised Land, the Comprehensive History of the Tulsa Race Ride of 1921. He and Dr. John Hope Franklin served as the lead scholars for the Tulsa Race Riot Commission, and Scott has been involved in legal um, efforts to win compensation for survivors of that tra tragic episode. So let's welcome Dr. Scott Ellsworth. Does that sound right? Am I to use this? Yes, there we go, boom. How are y'all doing? Thanks so much for coming out on this, uh, on this rainy day. I, I have to tell you, though, that um, Lynn lied to you a little bit, and the Durham County Libraries lied to you a bit, and, and it has to do with the idea of a reading. And while I, will, I can read something at the end, I, it's been my sort of take on readings that unless you have a beautiful Irish brogue or a lilting South African or Jamaican accent, that readings can be a little bit precious. So... Um, but, but fear not, because uh, my publisher had me record the audio book uh, for The Secret Game, and if you're really dying to hear it, you can hear me read for 11 hours and 39 minutes. But, you know, what I want to do today is just, uh, first of all, just, just to mention just how honored I am to be here, particularly in this place right here in Haiti. It's an honor to be back, you know, in Durham as well, too. This is this is very much a Durham book, and it's a Haiti book as well, too. And the book itself, which some of you all might know, um, it revolves around this amazing milestone. It's both, both a sports milestone, and it's also a milestone in, in our civil rights history. And it is, is was that in, on March 19th, Sunday, March 19th, 1944, not very far from here, in the men's gymnasium, the old men's gymnasium at North Carolina College, there was, the, there was a clandestine uh, integrated college basketball game between the North Carolina College Eagles and a wartime team of college all-stars from the Duke University Medical School. And th the story, th this game is, is it's really out of time in a way. This is 1954 is um, 20 years before the Selma March. It's, it's 11 years before the Montgomery bus boycott. In fact, it's three years before Jackie Robinson desegregates Major League Baseball, and that's in the North. That's how unusual this event is. Um, and what I thought I would do is I'd just talk to you a little bit about sort of how the book happened uh, and, and what I think its lessons are, and then we can just have a good old-fashioned conversation, and um, you know, we can talk a bit about it and see if there's any questions that you all have about it. I have to admit to you that from the start that this was not the book I'd planned to write, not whatsoever. So uh, in the 19, nearly 20, 20 years ago, I was a historian at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and I pretty much decided that I didn't want to be a college professor, something that was helped by the fact that there weren't a lot of jobs for my generation of PhDs. I had taught briefly at Howard University, which I enjoyed, and then I had a postdoc at the Smithsonian and I started what would be 10 years working as an oral historian at the National Museum of American History. I'd done a lot of work on, on race relations. I'd, I'd published this, this book already on the worst incident of racial violence in American history, which happened in my hometown of Tulsa in 1921. And I, I was looking for a, a book that I might be able to write that, that I had some expertise in, 
that, that was something I cared about, and I thought about race, and I thought about basketball. I was a great college basketball fan at that point. And t it also felt to me, I, I knew that there was a great change that had happened in basketball between the 1930s and the 1960s, but I'd never felt that it had really been explained. Uh, I came to learn later that there's a saying in publishing circles in New York City about sports books, and the saying is, the bigger the ball, the worse the book. And what that means is there's this wonderful literature of golf. There's wonderful golf books. There's this tremendous literature of baseball, you know, how baseball is all part of the American soul and all that kind of stuff. And in those days, with some exceptions, when you get to football and basketball, the books weren't all that great. So I thought maybe I could write a book because I thought basketball was so important to our story and if I could bring it in. And so I was going to write a book about the 1957 Final Four. And any basketball fans out there? Anybody? Yes. Do you, anybody know who was in the 57 Final Four? Lynn, who was in it? Or who do you? So it was the University of North Carolina, which was still segregated. Uh, All-white team under Frank McGuire. And uh, the, other two, the other three teams are Michigan State, which had an African-American player named Johnny Green. The two-time national defending national champion. Anyone can get that? Th no, it was the University of San Francisco, a small Jesuit school who had a Bill Russell and Casey Jones on its team. And the last school was the University of Kansas, which is the most historic college basketball team uh, to begin with, and it had uh, Wilt Chamberlain, the great African-American player. So I saw this, this story about race and, and money and television coming in, and I worked quite a while on it. Interviewed lots of players, did a lot of research and all that. And then I made the mistake of going up to Springfield, Massachusetts to do some research in uh, the Basketball Hall of Fame. And um, there was an induction ceremony during the weekend I was there, and at one point I just wandered over to watch the proceedings. And uh, an elderly African-American gentleman by the name of John McLennan came over, introduced himself to me, and I had heard of him. I, he was a coach. He was in Kansas. Somehow he was from Kansas or something. And, but I couldn't quite figure out who he was. And um, the more we talked, you know, uh, the more I sort of my ears started to perk up. And what blew my mind is that, that, he's, that he had actually known James Naismith, who had invented basketball more than a century earlier. John McClendon was the last student of James Naismith in the 1930s when McClendon was an undergraduate at the University of Kansas and Naismith was ending his career. And that got my attention. And then he mentioned that they were about to have the, the 50th anniversary of the CIAA basketball tournament, of course, very important uh, African-American uh, you know, athletic league. And, uh, and he was telling stories about how difficult travel was in the early days. And I thought this would make a good story. So I knew the sports editor at the New York Times. I called him up. I was living in Durham at the time. And I said, look, I'd like to, I'd left D.C. and was back in North Carolina. And I'd like to do a profile on John McClendon. The editor said, great, that was good. So I flew from Durham up to Cleveland, had a wonderful interview with, with Mr. McClendon, Coach McClendon. And then at the end of the day, at the end of the interview, he pulls out this sheet of paper. And it's sort of racial firsts in basketball that he had been involved with. And there was nobody who had been involved as, as, in as many as he was. He was the first, essentially the first black coach in the pros. He was the first African-American to be an assistant Olympic basketball coach. He was the first African-American coach to win a, an, a desegregated National College Basketball Championship, which was the NAIA at Tennessee State in 1957. He was the first African-American basketball coach at a historically white school, Cleveland State, on and on and on. And at the top of the list, though, it said 1944, North Carolina College for Negroes, which is what Central was called then, versus a military team from the Duke University Medical School, first integrated college basketball game in the South. And I, he's talking on, and I'm looking at this, I'm thinking he's not very good at typing because it can't be 1944. And, and finally, I interrupt. I say, excuse me, Coach, this has got to be 1954, 1964, right? And he says no, and he talks about it. And at that point, my little book on the 1957 Final Four was torpedoed 
forever to sleep, slip beneath the waves. And so what happened took a long time to do. Uh, for the first you know, couple of years or so, I put together the basic story of the game. It took a while to track a lot of people down, put it together. I wrote a story for the New York Times Magazine, not ABC News Nightline, picked this up, and that was all good. And we had a reunion here in Durham, got the players at the old gym. It hadn't been remodeled yet. And, uh, you know, it was a wonderful moment. But there was something that kept bugging me. And what was bugging me was I kept seeing the shadows of a couple of larger stories that I didn't think had been told. One of them was a basketball story, and one of them was a story about civil rights. And, and the basketball story has to do with basically how the game developed and changed but it's also the birth of the, mo of the modern game of basketball. Back in, you know, before, you know, the late 1930s, basketball was very mechanical. Um, there was a lot of passing. There was very little scoring. You could have games in the 20s that were 12 to 10. Um, you know, set, there was no three-point shots. There was no shot clock, all of that. They also had a, uh, a rule that after every made field goal, play would stop and the players from both teams would gather at the center court and they would reenact the, the opening tip. It was called the center jump after every single goal. So I knew that there, there was a change that went on, but what I came to realize is that John McClendon, and particularly John McClendon here in Durham, is the great architect of modern basketball. He's one of the people, nobody knows who he is, Frank, you know, around the country, aside from a few folks, but he is, he is really one of the great geniuses. And to give you an example of it, when he came to North Carolina College as, as a basketball coach uh, in, in 1938, this was the year when the center jump is eliminated, and you start to have something called the fast break. It's the fast break only in comparison. So college basketball teams in those, those years would maybe score 40 or 50 points a game. John McClendon's North Carolina Eagles in the 1943-44 season scored 60, 70, 80 points a game. They defeated uh, St. Augs at home in, in Raleigh 119 to 34. This was the highest scoring college basketball game, college basketball team in the entire United States. Nobody was close to what he was doing, you know, and, and he, f he found a way for his players to move the ball. It, it would seem nothing today, but in those days to move the ball down court in 15 seconds would have been miraculous. He got them to do it in three or four seconds and have a shot as well. The other thing that McClendon did is that he also develops the first full court pressure defense. And that hadn't been seen before. And so his players, they're always going. They're always going for the ball. They're going at it. And the irony of this is that some of these ideas came from Dr. Naismith. So remember, before McClendon came to, to Durham, he had been an undergraduate at the University of Kansas, one of a handful of African-American undergraduates. They lived a very precarious existence. They could not live in the dormitories. They could not eat in the dining hall. They couldn't attend any of the, the dances or other things like that. There was, an, there was an attempt made to prevent McClendon from becoming the first physical education major at, at KU because he would have had to have swam in the indoor swimming pool, and so which was all white. McClendon went ahead and, and integrated it one day anyway, after which the manager drained the water in the pool. There was a big fight that developed. Finally, McClendon is allowed to graduate. But Naismith was a forgotten man. Here's this, this interesting, very earthy Canadian-American doctor and minister who had grown up very poor in Canada, invents basketball. And, but by the 1930s, nobody pays any attention to him because his ideas are so different. He doesn't care about scoring. He doesn't think s basketball games needed to, be, to have scores. Uh, he thought that any number of players could be on a team and on the floor at the same time. If you wanted 10 people, fine. If you wanted 100, that was fine with him. It was all about recreation. He didn't like commercialization, other things that bothered him. But McClendon and Naismith and McClendon formed this deep bond. McClendon saw something in the old man's ideas. And to give you an example of how forgotten he was, in 1936, there was the Olympic Games, the Summer Olympics, the Berlin Olympics, the Nazi Olympics in Germany. And school children in, in Kansas had collected pennies 
to send Dr. Naismith to go to these games. And so it was this great trip of a lifetime, and Naismith never had any money, and you know, sails across the ocean, shows up in the Berlin train station, goes to the Olympic headquarters, and nobody has any idea who he is. There are no passes for him. There's nothing. He's the only living person to have invented a game that was a sport at the Olympics. So he's a forgotten man. And that, w- that was taken care of, but he's forgotten. But there was something that McClendon saw. And one day, Naismith and McClendon were sitting in a playground in Lawrence, Kansas, and there was a group of set six- or seven-year-olds, quote, playing basketball, which meant... It's a scrum of kids, and they're sort of following whoever has the ball, moving back and forth. There's no passing. There's very little shooting. It's just kind of this madness. And, and during that time, Naismith suddenly jumped up and said, that's it. That's how you play the game. And that kept turning in McClendon's mind, and that gets him to this full-court pressure defense. It gets him the idea of having a super fast, fast break. The other great breakthrough that McClendon did here in, at North Carolina College and in, here in Durham and in Hayti, is that he also creates a conditioning program for athletes none like had been seen before. Up until the 1930s, uh, most college basketball conditioning programs had players uh, do jumping jacks or deep knee bends, uh, maybe dribble around a couple of chairs and stuff like that. McClendon had his players long before jogging was introduced in the United States out running into the country miles and miles a week. His players were in tip-top condition, and as a result, they were really on the cutting edge, and they were playing a new, fast-paced kind of basketball that we would recognize. But there was a problem, and the problem was this. This is, of course, prior to television. Television isn't in the nation's home. So if you want to see a basketball game, you pretty much have to go. But you can only go so far if you're at a black college because even though we have an NCAA tournament then and we have the NIT, the African-American schools are not allowed to take part. So for McClendon, and he, he had made this incredible breakthrough, he had found the path to the future, but there was no way for him to know how good it really was beyond the confines of the CIAA. So that's something that would haunt him and something that he wanted to know. The other thing, and... McClendon talked to me about this as well, too. It's hard to imagine today, but he says, uh, up through World War II, he said, black coaches and players, because they hardly played against whites at all, always had it in the back of their mind a question as to whether we could measure up. Were we as good as as these white teams? And they wouldn't know until they would play. All right. So the second story, and, and across, and there's another basketball story that happens across town at Duke University. Uh, Duke had, you know, started playing basketball fairly late, actually, not until the uh, 1910s or so, but they, by the 1930s, they had developed, the Blue Devils had developed a very good team, and there was a visionary there, too. This is a small part of the story, but it's a part of it, and his name was Eddie Cameron. Eddie Cameron was a a Pennsylvanian who ended up coming to Duke as, as, as a basketball coach, was also an assistant football coach as well, too, but by the 1930s, there starts to be something of a buzz going on in, in basketball in North Carolina. They have all very small gyms and field houses at Duke as well, too. And Cameron was of the belief that there was a future for basketball. And so he twisted arms, did this, and convinced the university administration that they needed to have a brand new basketball facility. And, and, and going against everyone and going against the architects, he convinced Duke to build the largest basketball facility, you know, uh, in the south, below the Potomac River. We think today that Cameron Indoor Stadium is this quaint little dinky thing. Well, it was gigantic in its day. Nobody had seen it. It's called the Indoor Stadium. So there were people that were pressing ahead and looking ahead to a bigger vision. The other change that happened, and this affected all the schools, but it's hard to get your hand al- hands around today, is that... When the United States went to war after Pearl Harbor, every, all parts of our society essentially go to war. So does college basketball. So during the war years, most college teams didn't play regular schedules anymore. In, instead, they played half of their games, sometimes all of their games, against military basketball teams. 
These were teams created by the Army, the Navy, the Air Corps, the Marine Corps, and all of that. And they were, they were terrific teams. They were, they were used as morale builders. At, at, uh, in Chapel Hill, there was a, a naval pre-flight team called the Cloud Busters that was one of the greatest teams in the South. Uh, in fact, in the 1943-44 Converse Basketball uh, yearbook, the, quote, best, the highest-ranked college basketball team in America is from the Great Lakes Naval Station in Chicago. So you have all these really great, great military teams, and the best one at Duke was at the medical school. These are all former college players who are now Army and Navy officers who are in a hurry-up program at the medical school to create doc to train doctors for the war effort. And uh, the medical school team at Duke had an All-American from uh, West Virginia, had an All-Southern Conference Center, it had a member of Duke's Southern Conference Championship team. It had terrific players. They beat everyone they played. They beat textile mill teams, factory teams. They scrimmaged the actual Duke varsity and creamed them. So this was a really top-notch team. All right. So there's a basketball story in the book. There's also a civil rights story. And many of you all are familiar with the history of Durham, particularly the history of Haiti. And, and that the history of Haiti is often shown in this era as a history of building and of upbuilding. We learn about the building and the expansion of, of North Carolina Central. We learn about North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, about the banks, the various businesses, and, and that goes with that. We learn about the political activity, learn about the great churches, all of that. But what I found as I got into the story that just astounded me is all of the people in Durham, particularly in Haiti, who are fighting open, openly against segregation and against Jim Crow. So th the idea that is basically taught to high school students during these days is that, you know, until Rosa Parks, until the Montgomery bus boycott, there was a lot of, of embittered acceptance of, of segregation, but there's not any, there's not much of a sense that people are pushing back and what I found is that there were a lot of people pushing back in Durham. You know, 11 years before Rosa Parks does, you know, refuses to move to the back of the bus in, in uh, Montgomery, you have African-American high school students here in Durham who not only are not going to the back of the bus, they're getting pulled off the bus by white policemen and arrested as well, too. You have African-American GIs who are stationed at Camp Butner who are going downtown into white clothing stores where tradi traditionally African Americans would not go. They would try on clothes. They were, there are people who are breaking the rules and pushing back in lots of different ways. And th the thing is, though, that when you did this in, in any form whatsoever, you can take your freedom into your hands, you could take your life into your hands. The same year of the secret game, a black soldier by the name of Private First Class Booker T. Spicely uh, who was uh, at Camp Butner undergoing training, came into Durham on a, on a two-day weekend pass. Um, he boards a, uh, a, a Durham city bus, and of course city buses in Durham, like every city in the South, were segregated, blacks in back, whites in the front. Boards a bus right off of Fayetteville, right off of where we are, um, uh, with a few other people, the white bus driver. There are no, there are no uh, and sits near the front. There are no white passengers. The white bus driver doesn't like it, but he doesn't say anything. When the bus gets to five points, the white bus driver angrily tells Private Spicely, who is in his uniform, incidentally, to move all the way to the back. They start to get into an argument. Uh, Spicely says, look, I thought I was fighting a, a war for democracy. I guess I'm not. Goes back and forth. The argument gets heated. When the, bu the bus, which is, ends in, in, in Walltown, uh, as it gets closer to that, there's all this tension on the bus, white and black riders as well. Um, Private Spicely decides that maybe he's gone over the line. And he says, excuse me, Mr. Bus Driver, I didn't mean anything by what I said. I was just talking, no harm done. So we think that's the end of the story. The bus pulls up uh, uh, on Club Boulevard right by a Watts Hospital, um, end of the line. Private Spicely gets off the bus. The white bus driver gets off the bus. The white bus driver pulls out his 44 caliber revolver and shoots Pirate Spicely in the back three times and murders him right there on the sidewalk. 
No one bothers to go across the street to Watts Hospital because it's an all-white hospital. And all-white hospitals in the South don't take black patients. He ends up dying there. The, court, the, the whole incident becomes this big cause celeb. Um, at first, the, the driver is going to be charged with murder. Then that's knocked down to manslaughter. There is a trial. There's no question as to what happened. There's no, no idea that Private Spicely was coming towards the bus driver or anything like that. Everyone agrees on the facts. Um, the all-white jury deliberated for exactly 18 minutes before they acquitted the bus driver. So if you are to cross the color line in Durham in 1944, you can take your lives into your hands. What surprised me as well, too, is that there were some whites who were also crossing the color line as well, too. You know, once again, you've got a lot of soldiers in the South. The American Army and Marine Corps and Navy was essentially trained at Southern Army bases. There are some other bases elsewhere, but most of our soldiers were trained here. So you've got lots and lots of white and black soldiers from the north, the Midwest, and the west who are not used to seeing upfront racial segregation. So they're coming here, and you see people who are starting to push back against it. You had white GIs who would go into black cafes in the West End to try to get you know, food to eat and you know, disregarding any, any, any segregation laws. There was also right downtown at the National Guard Armory, they would have dances and uh, ma mainly for whites to come and dance, but on, I think on Thursday nights they had Negro nights. And that meant that black couples could be down on the dance floor dancing while whites could buy tickets to sit in the balcony and, uh, and watch. And what would happen on these Negro nights is, is invariably, two-thirds of the way into it, GIs, white GIs and their dates would, would come down off the balcony and jump in and start dancing with everyone else until somebody called the police and ran them off. So you've got people who are pushing back. And uh, one incredible couple that was pushing back was by the name of Ernst and Mariana Manassi. These were two German Jewish refugees who uh, got out of Europe literally by the skin of their teeth. Ernst arrived here in September 1939, the year that um, the year the war declared. He was, uh, he was a, a, a Jew. He was from uh, uh, near the Polish border grew up in a rural area. Uh, he was a philosopher. He went to the University of Heidelberg, uh, received his PhD in 1933, which is, of course, the year that Hitler takes power, where books are burned on the streets. And for two years, Ernst sort of makes his way living from hand to, hand to mouth in Germany. When his father dies in 1935, he goes back to his hometown to attend the funeral. Um, and even though Polish, and even though his father was a Jewish farm implement dealer, some of the local Polish Catholic farmers had shown up to attend the funeral, where they were met with by stormtroopers, Nazi stormtroopers, with literature saying, "Why are you here? The death of a Jew is nothing to be sad about. You shouldn't be here." And then any who went in, they 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 wrote down their names and then published them in the Nazi newspaper. So at this point, Manassie is able to escape briefly to uh, Italy where he teaches at a German Jewish refugee school. There he meets a beautiful artist by the name of Mariana Bernhard, who grew up in upper class Berlin. They're teaching there. Things are fine until you get around 1938. Uh, it, people forget this, but M Mussolini wasn't particularly anti-Semitic. But when, as Italy moved closer and closer with Nazi Germany, allowances had to be made. So when Adolf Hitler visited Italy in 1938, the Manassis and the other members of, of the small German Jewish refugee school, they were all arrested and thrown in jail, and they were told they could no longer stay in Italy. And there was this race against time. His wife and child were able to go to Brazil where they had family, but Ernst got a one-year appointment in England and then had to come back to, to Germany, and he was on his way, as he said, to you know eventually being killed. But uh, he was saved by, of all people, Dr. James Shepard, the president and founder of North Carolina Central University, who went ahead and, like a number of other African-American college presidents, offered some help to these, Ju these Jewish scholars from, from Germany. So he comes here. He becomes the first white faculty member at North Carolina Central, and he lives this weird world where he's the only white, you know, certainly on campus. He's, most days, he's the only white person in Haiti. Then he'll go back to his wife and children at their little rented apartment in a subdivided house over by East Campus. 
But um, the Manassees, th you know, think about this. So in Germany, they had seen plenty of signs, Jews forbidden, no Jews allowed, Jewish entrance, those kinds of things. But when they came to the United States, despite essentially being enemy aliens with very little status, they made a decision that when they saw the whites only, no colored, allowed that they were going to fight against that too. So what they started to do is to hold secret gatherings of college faculty from white from the U University of North Carolina, whites from Duke, and African-American professors from North Carolina Central at their apartment uh, over near, near Duke East Campus. These were just a way it's to define the color line. This is a way of sharing. They went along until the Ku Klux Klan, the local chapter of the Durham Klan, found out, showed up their door, and threatened to murder them and their children and to burn their apartment building down. It turns out, though, that the Manassees aren't the only ones. Um, there are Christian students at both Duke and at North Carolina College who are also looking towards a different kind of uh, America when we get out of the war. Uh, they're both allied with the YMCA. You know, we think the YMCA today is like a health club. Um, when I was a kid, the YMCA was a gymnasium. It was a place where you learned how to swim and stuff like that. But in the 1930s, 1940s, the YMCA was also a college organization. There was a chapter at North Carolina College. There was one at Duke. During this 1943-44 year, they make contact with each other, and they start holding secret prayer meetings on Sunday evenings here in Hayton. It's very dangerous to do that. I spoke to some of the whites who came over. They were very worried about getting arrested as they came over. And it was out of these meetings and sort of the social atmosphere later on that the college students started talking about different things. Their school, your school, sports. We got a pretty good basketball team at our school. Oh, yeah, we got a pretty good one at, at ours. And it is out of that that this whole notion of the secret game uh, came alive. Um, what I'd like to do is I, I want to I'd, I'd like to I'd like to close with a couple of ideas, open things up for questions. I'm happy to read a little as well too, but I'd like to see what you all would like to do. I want to I want to close with a couple of thoughts right now. The first is, you know, um, history is made by all sorts of people. Um, you know, we are used to reading history books about. George Washington or Martin Luther King or, or whoever it is, well-known, famous individuals, household names, uh, Lincoln, you name it, who had, who had big impacts on the world, and they did. But the reality of history is that much of American history is made by people like you and I, people whose names are never going to be known, people who are a part of anonymous American life. I, uh, I was very fortunate to find this story I was even more fortunate to run into a, a group of elderly men and women, all of whom are gone now, or almost all, who were a part of this book and who opened their doors to me. In Hayti, there were a lot of folks, certainly John of Franklin, who I'd known, uh, Leroy Walker, I spent several years with John McClendon, um, uh, Ed and Ruth Boyd, Alex Rivera. There were a lot of people who helped me and realized that this was a serious story and that it was one that needed to be told. But as I came to know these men and women, and I came to learn of the private Booker Spiceleys and some of these other folks, I just became so impressed by this generation, particularly of young African Americans here in Haiti, but also their white allies as well, too, who during World War II are fighting back against Jim Crow, fighting back against segregation. They are freeing themselves mentally of this horror that they're all trapped in. And what they're really doing is they're laying the groundwork for the, for the civil rights movement. You know, we may not have heard of these people, but they are really parts of those who are pushing forward and helping to create our world. The other thing, imperfect as it is, the other, the other thing is, um, you know, this book, there's, a, there's chapters set in Kansas, there's a, a chapter in Indiana, a chapter in New York City, a chapter in Nazi Germany, but most of the book is... Um, it, it's a book about Durham, and, it, and, and this book, for however well it does or doesn't do, is going to start to introduce people not only to the story of the secret game, but also to Hayti as well, also to Durham, 
also to this basketball story as well. Uh, you know, right now you can buy The Secret Game in New Delhi. You can buy it in London. I heard last night from a woman who read it in Albania. Um, you know, there are people in Australia who have written me. And so, and, and regardless of the book itself, I think the actual story of The Secret Game is compelling enough that this is going to become part of basketball's story, and it's going to become a story that, w that one day is going to be known for, you know, uh, in different corners of the world. But the reality of it is, and speaking here on this stage, and I'm so honored to be here, is that this is a Durham story, and this is a Haytai story, and I want to thank all of you for allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you very much. So why don't we see if anybody's got any questions? I know you don't want me to read 11 hours and 39 minutes. I've already done that. That was a piece of work, I have to tell you. So do they, do they need to come up to you, or can they just? Come on, come on up. Somebody, doesn't somebody want to come up? All right, sure. Sure. No, that's that's not true. They uh, they locked the door. Um, they locked the doors to the gym, but people found out about the game anyway. I mean, part of it had to do with one of the players, a wonderful guy from Farrell, Pennsylvania, the star of the Eagles, uh, named Hen Henry Thomas. Although everybody called him Big Dog, he started putting rumors that something was going to go on in the gym the next day. But also, you know, there were. This is hard to believe. There were very few cars on campus at North Carolina College during the war years. Uh, and you've got this strange car that shows up there. People hear about it. And so what happened as the day went on, more and more students start, after church particularly, start to drift over and try to get in the gym. They can't get in it. And they started to climb up on the window ledges and look in to see what was going on. And they were shocked by it. The other, the other thing that, that we that I later put together as well, too, is that there was a reporter at the game. So Durham, as some of you all may know, was then, as is now, the home of the Carolina Times. And the founding editor of the Carolina Times, Lewis Austin, was one of the greatest advocates for civil rights and freedom and liberty in the entire history of North Carolina. He is somebody who attacked Jim Crow every day. He was absolutely fearless in person. Um, you know, he would show up at, at trials where um, uh, everyone was convinced that anyone black was going to get lynched. He would show up in the small town to cover the trial. When Roland Hayes, who was a famous Negro tenor, sang at the Carolina Theater, and of course in those days, white people sat down below, black people up in the balcony, he showed up and just bust, brushed past the ushers and sat down on the front row. I mean, he was somebody who, you know, uh, you know people when he heard that some folks in town were about to kill him, he showed up at their door and said, I want to let you know I'm here. I'm ready when you are. And uh, this guy took, you know, had a lot of guts. Well, Austin had a problem during the war, which all newspaper editors did, which is all their reporters are in uniform. So you have to look around and get anyone that you can. Um, in fact, my advisor at Duke, Larry Goodwin, was at age 16 a reporter for a San Antonio Daily newspaper because they were just desperate. But there was a man by the name of Lynn Holloway who was a, a student or recent graduate at North Carolina Central, and he had started a, a, a column, and uh, he heard about the game, and he showed up at the game, he took notes, and he said, I've got the scoop of a lifetime. I mean, because he knew that, of course, Austin would love the story, put it on the front page, it's going to go out over the, the National Negro News Service. This will be in black papers all over the country and probably get in white papers as well, too, because of how uh, unusual it was. And, but he realized that if he, if he wrote the story, if he gave it to Austin, that McClendon would get fired, uh, all the students would get kicked out of both schools, uh, anything could happen. You know, beyond that, they might get thrown in jail. And so the, the reporter killed the story. Yes. No, there is only one document, um, a written document from the period on the game. Um, there was a wonderful player on the Duke team. So most most of the Duke players were all Southerners, okay? 
And most of them were none too excited about playing the game when this came out because it's outside of how you live. We just don't do things like that. Um, but there was, a, there was a player by the name of Jack Burgess. Jack Burgess had grown up uh, uh, next to an Indian reservation in eastern Montana. His father was a dentist. And uh, so he'd grown up playing with Indian kids as well, too. And at the University of Mo he, had, he had been recruited by Fog Allen at Kansas, a great coach. But he ended up staying home with the University of Kansas that had a black player. And that was his, his roommate on the road. So he... He, his, his, he did not have a racial problem by 1940s terms. He comes to Durham, and he's just shocked at the signs. Why, tell him, why do you do this? What the hell is this all about? And then he had this very telling experience. So the Duke Hospital actually had a very, very small colored ward, very unusual, tiny colored ward. And uh, the medical students, you know, once a week or uh, at least once a week would make rounds. So they would go with their professor and they would each go, and, and because they're all they're they're treating patients as well, because it's the war and all that. So, y when you're a medical student, you you get to your, you know you take turns. You get to your patient. You, this is Mr. Jones, and he has this and whatnot. You present it to your professor, the other people, and they look at the chart and all that. Well, when they got to Burgess's patient, uh, it was an African American woman in this tiny ward, and he said, "This is Mrs. Smith. She's got this condition and all that," and, and you know presents it. And then they go out in the hall, and both the professor and all of his fellow students lit into him and said, what the hell are you doing calling her Mrs.? You know, you don't do that here. You don't call him Mr., you don't call him Mrs., you just use by the first name, and just gave him hell about it. And uh, he, he, he ended up, as a result of that, deciding he was going to fight his own little undeclared war against Jim Crow. So as soon as he heard about the idea of the game, he was all for it. It took him a while to convince the others. But there were others like that who are, who are pushing against it. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Oh, I'm not repeating the questions. Okay, all right. They can, but they're all nervous to go to the mic. Okay, I'll repeat your question. Um, so who else in the white Well, I, there's a lot of soldiers who are doing this. Um, you know, there was, um, y you know, and it's, part of it is just getting attention. Okay, so prior to the secret game in, in, I think in the 1940 or 41, this will give you an example. Um, the Harvard Glee Club came down to Duke to sing at a special wartime program in the Duke Chapel. So it was a, a Glee Club from, you know, choral society from Duke. Duke is, of course, completely all white. There was a choral group from Farmville College, and also the Harvard College was coming down. It was this beautifully well thought. The war's already, we're not in it yet, but the war's already raging in Europe, and it's this thoughtful program and, you know, singing these poems and great choral works and all that. But as soon as Duke found out that there was an African-American in the Harvard Glee Club, his name is Drew King. He was uh, uh, the son of, a, of a, 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 a doctor in Tuskegee. Uh, people Duke said, don't, if you're going to bring him, don't come, you know, because we're not going to have a black person sing in the Duke Chapel. That's how extreme it was. Um, there was, and, and so what happened is that the Harvard, the Harvard folks collapsed. They, uh, they left him at home. They did the program. And in the Duke Crown Chronicle, there was exactly one murmur of, of someone saying that this is wrong. This isn't how we should do it. There was a, there was a, a, a Duke, a Duke GI who had been, I think he'd been a student council, off, student, student officer, student government officer, had served in the Pacific, comes back near the end of the war, and he wrote to the president of Duke at that time, uh, or met with him and said that he thought that Duke needed to start taking black students at the end of the war. And this was so outrageous that the president of Duke at that time, we have a letter where he writes to someone else that, that said, thank goodness I was in my office because I just would have, you know, beat the hell out of him for even suggesting that. So it's, they're just people who are not 
going to do. That's just not how you do things. You know, but during the war, you've got people are they're pushing back, you know, and it takes a lot of guts to do what they did. I mean, I think you can, in my book, I, I don't know whether the answer, whether this is happening in Nashville, in Jacksonville, Florida, or why not, but boy, you look at Durham and people are really, there. there's a movement against this. So either Durham is one of the great um, precursors, it is one of the great precursors of the civil rights movement, there's no question about that. But people are pushing further and further. You know, I'm going to read one thing. I'll read one thing and I'll try to get a passage. So um, this will just take a couple minutes. I've actually never read anything but the, uh, from the book before. But this is what this is about. So the secret game has already happened. There have been some repercussions. Some other things have happened to. McClendon got punished for this but was able to escape. There's, and I can talk to you a little bit more about how word got out amongst basketball players as to what's going on. But there's also the student body at North Carolina Central has largely heard of this event, and they've been inspired by what happened. Okay? But they're also part of this younger generation who is of African Americans who are now pushing back. They're trying to figure out a way to, to move ahead. And so the question has to do with Dr. Shepard. Dr. Shepard is the founder of Central He's, he's very, he's a wonderful builder, but he's also very conservative in many ways. It's, it's very difficult. So I'll just read a little bit of this. I'll read a page and a half. So Dr. This is, this is almost the end of the book. Dr. Shepard never mentioned the secret game. If he knew about it, and there was very little on campus he did not know about, he said nothing. Either way, however, the campus that he presided over for for, for so long like the South itself was changing. And eight months after the game, in the fall of 1944, he got a foreshadowing of what that new world would be like. Now, a man of practical inclination, Shepard had long relished bringing well-known speakers to campus, white as well as Negro. Not only would they generate publicity and expose his students to important perspectives of some of the leading men of both the South and the nation, it was also a way for him to expand his contacts, raise money, and in particular, protect the funding he had already carefully secured. So along with writers and statesmen and religious leaders, Shepard made sure that white North Carolina politicians regularly spoke to the student body at the college. Clyde Roark Hoey was one. With his snow white hair, striped trousers, high top shoes, and an ever-present red carnation pinned to the left lapel of his swallow-tailed walking coat, Hoey would have looked at home in a Courier and Ives print or maybe a Thomas Nast cartoon. The son of a captain in the Confederate Army, Hoey had left school at age 12 to take a job in a Cleveland County print shop. Five years later, he brought his own, bought his own newspaper, and four years after that, he was elected to the state legislature. A teetotaler who drank as many as a dozen bottles of Coca-Cola every day. He was the epitome of an old school Southern politician, a yellow dog Democrat who once declared that the Lord would never lead him into the Republican Party. A spellbinding orator, when he got through, you weren't sure what he said, but it was beautiful, one confidant remarked, while another observed, he just took the Bible and wrapped the American flag right around it. He was wildly popular among North Carolina voters. A former state legislator and U.S. congressman, he was elected governor in 1936, and eight years later, in 1944, he was elected to the United States Senate, carrying 97 of the state's 100 counties. Okay. So not long after this, he comes to speak at North Carolina College. Okay, for, so get this. So here's this old school ancient-minded on racial matters, white politician who's coming to speak at the auditorium at, at Central. And here, and for Shepard, this is a big moment, okay. Held in B.N. Duke Auditorium, Hoey's address was attended by the entire student body. You had to go, one undergraduate recalled. Every seat had a number on it, and you were assigned to a particular one. If you didn't show up, Dr. Shepard would know. For Shepard, this was a tremendously important day, one that was rife with promise. As governor, Hoey had steered precious funds, state funds towards North Carolina College. As an incoming United States Senator, 
he could open even more doors. And Hoey, for his part, had spoken in the auditorium before. Indeed, he had helped dedicate the building. But this time, it would be different. For as the former governor began his address, something extraordinary happened. It had to do with the word Negro. Hoey pronounced it Negro. And whenever he did, students began rubbing the soles of their shoes on the auditorium floor. At first, it was just a few, but by the fourth or fifth time, the scraping and rubbing filled the auditorium and began to drown out the speaker. Dr. Shepard furiously bolted upright in his chair and glared out at the students, but the scuffing did not stop. And as the senator-elect droned on about Negro schools and Negro leaders and Negro progress, there could still be heard the sound of shoe leather being scraped across the auditorium floor like the first whisperings of a rising wind. Okay. More questions? Anyone else? Are we good? Shall we sign some books? What do y'all want to do? Yes, hey. Good to see you again, Scott. Good uh, to see you. Appreciate your coming. Uh, I'm going to get a little emotional. Okay. Thank you. And introduce yourself to folks. My, excuse me. My name is Ed, Ed Boyd. My dad was the manager of Central City, North Carolina College at Durham for Negroes team. Uh, thank you for your work. May you do more. Uh, a lot of people, especially young black people and Caucasians, don't realize what, what Jim, Jim Crow was. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I didn't try on clothes until I was age 10 years old in the store. There was, as you said, there were certain things you just did not do. Uh, and nothing has changed but the date. And unless and until, I don't know if any of you have seen uh, Malcolm X, the scene where he's in the shower with Baines, the black Muslim, who takes him to the dictionary, and for white, there's pure imperfection and all of these glowing terms, white lies, black lies. And for black, there's only one positive meaning. I have yet to have any English teachers come up with more definitions other than a positive balance in your money. Right. Uh, unless and until that changes, Nothing changes, because it starts, yeah. excuse me, in the mind. Uh, I fear it will never change, because people are people. And the one constant thing changes is abhorrent to most people. Uh, so again, I'm going to say thank you. And uh, for you all to think about the, excuse me, I'm not a shield. Think about the great work he has done and appreciate it to the utmost. Well, Thanks. and I, I want to say this about, and I want to say this to you, and I've said to other people. So, you know, this is, this is kind of what I do is my job. So I, I, I do lots of oral interviews with people. I've done lots of interviews with black people as well as white people. Got to get used to who's this white stranger from the other side of the tracks, all that stuff. But I have never met in my life anyone who was as open and confident and who knew who they were as your parents were. Um, Ed, Ed and Ruth, Ruth was one of the Spaldings, his, his mom, and Ed, his dad, was a longtime uh, physical education uh, and very important person in the park department here. He was also the team manager. But they, you know, oftentimes when you talk to somebody who's not from your community or not from your race or religion, you don't really kind of want to open up all the stuff they opened up everything. Right. They told me the good stories, the bad stories, and all of that. They were people who knew who they were, and they were people, I cannot tell you how deeply I admire your parents. And they are, they're the reason that this book, in many ways, they made the book, they made the book come alive. There's no question about that. So I thank you. I, thank I really you. do. Thanks. All right. All right well, thanks a lot, y'all. Lynn, shall we sign some books?